So good morning again, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Stahlberger, and I am Director of Elections for Blue Earth County. I'm actually Director of the Property and Environmental Resources Department. And so in that capacity, I'll be the Elections Administrator, and we'll be walking you through the training that you'll have uh, over uh, the next several sessions that you'll be signing up for. This will make you uh, certified to work in the 2020 election cycle, whether or not it's in the city of Mankato or if it's in one of our small cities or townships that also staffs election day polling places. Uh, the structure of this training is going to be question and answer based. It is also a recorded version of it, so we will have questions that will be coming uh, from the folks that are in person, and then the uh, footage will be available for anybody to watch afterwards. It'll live on our Blue Earth County website, which will have the link uh, for all of that information on one of the last slides that we'll be talking about this morning. So as we work through the materials, uh, we're going to cover a couple of areas in some pretty uh, extensive detail. And then the rest of the material that's in this first uh, module is really a background or kind of a resource guide for you. And that's the way that we want you to look at it as. Uh, as election judges attending the training, you receive a copy of all of the slides, and those are three hole punched. Uh, we did that so that you can bring those along on election day. If you want to put them in a binder or something like that, you're welcome to bring any and all of those resources with you to help you out uh, as you work on election day and handle some of those unusual circumstances. So feel free to write all over that, highlight it, make any notes that you might want to do. Uh, that'll help you along. And then the other resource that all of our election judges get is a copy of the election judge manual. And this is the 2022 version of the manual. And so if uh, returning judges have a copy of the manual that is from 2020 or before, you'll need to transfer your notes. That manual is now out of date. Um, but feel free to bring this along with you as well. And then I'll point out some uh, pages in here that will be very helpful, especially related to election day registration. Um, other than um, getting into some of those specific areas for Blue Earth County uh, that we want all of our judges to know, we'll also spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the different roles on election day for any of our judges who are brand new so that you can kind of understand what your day might look like. Uh, and then we'll also highlight just what's going to be happening with our equipment and with our e election judge workshop that many of you have signed up for. Uh, that's the course layout for today. Uh, it'll fill up the 90 minute session that we have uh, uh, ready and available for us. Uh, but I do want to make sure we answer any questions. So interrupt with any questions that you might have because there's a good chance if you have it, somebody else has that as well. Um, and this is class number three for us in person. So we um, would like to have the questions and make sure we're not missing any. So with that, we'll kick off into some of the specific materials. Uh, just a reminder, you're on step one, rules and processes for right now. Uh, as uh, election judges, you're required to get at least two hours of training. So many of you are going to complete that with that required equipment setup class, which is where we'll actually dive into the poll pad, the Omni ballot, and our DS200. That'll mean a lot more to you if you're brand new to being an election judge once you see uh, that next uh, session that you're signed up for. And then I know many folks have also signed up for that optional workshop. That's an opportunity for our new judges to actually use the equipment, ask questions that are very specific or that they may have thought of after they've uh, had some of these other courses. Or it also is a good refresher for judges that haven't done this for a couple of years. If you just want to practice checking in voters or something like that, that's the whole point of that workshop. And you're going to kind of be able to choose your own adventure during that session. All right, uh, this next slide is actually going to give you uh, some reminders that we want you to think about maybe the night before, the week before your election assignment. And this will kind of make sure that you're ready to work um, and you've kind of covered all the logistical bases that you might need to cover. So first off, let's not forget the August primary is August 9th. That's a Tuesday, of course, and then the general election is on Tuesday, November 8th. So you've either notified us that you're available for both of those elections or only one of those elections. If that's changed at all, you'll want to contact the elections office, contact our, our, our direct line or email us, and then we can update your status. If you're able to add an extra day to that, that you're now available, for sure let us know that we are still short a little bit of judges, especially for November. Um, or if you've got other folks that you can recruit, feel free to have them apply for November service as well. Okay. A couple other things that we need your help with as election judges. Uh, state law prohibits us from having election judges work together in the polling place if they're related, if they live together, um, or if it's a spousal or family partnership uh, sort of arrangement. Um, so if you are serving with somebody that you may be related to, make sure that we're aware of that if there's any chance that you might be assigned together. The reason I bring that up is sometimes we have somebody working in Eagle Lake maybe and their daughter's working in Mankato. 
that's never going to cross over, so we're okay there. But if uh, a, a father and a son are both assigned to Mankato precinct, we need to know that so we can separate those folks on election day. Okay? So be sure to share that with us. Additionally, state law prohibits candidates um, who are on the ballot from serving as an election judge in that polling place. And we also have to prohibit uh, relatives, spouses, uh, family members, householders of that candidate as well. So if you happen to be related to or are a candidate on the ballot where you're working, we have to find a new assignment for you where you would not have that prohibition be in effect. Okay. August election, we should be pretty good. Um, there's uh, just one primary for the mayor of Mankato. Otherwise, you'd have to be related to a federal or state level candidate. So not very likely. In November, that becomes a much bigger issue as we have many, many more names on the ballot. Last but certainly not least, we want to make sure that you inform us if you have any special conditions that would require accommodation in the polling place. We'll do our best to accommodate that, but we need to be aware of that. So just communicate that with Christy and myself or myself, and we'll I'll make sure that we can I'll work through that with you as best we can. Other than that, you just have a series of check boxes on this slide to kind of think about. Uh, we want to make sure that as you've signed up to work, uh, you've indicated to us if you're available to work the morning, the evening, or all day. If you said you're available for any of those options, spoiler alert, you'll be working all day. Um, <laughs> so consider yourself done in that category. Um, and in, that, in those instances, we want to make sure you're able to commit to that full shift. Uh, there are several reasons why we need to make sure we know who's going to be in the polling place uh, for the times that are allocated. So if we need to change shifting at all, uh, just let us know and we can try to accommodate that as well. Okay. All right, so let's move through a uh, next series of slides here. Uh, these slides are going to be slides that we want you to think about as a checklist. So as you're actually getting ready to work on election morning or work throughout election day, this is kind of your quick tips and tricks sheet to look at just to make sure you're thinking about what you're doing in the polling place. Sometimes we hear from judges that they get a little overwhelmed or they get a little anxious about what's going on. This is a good place for you to review before uh, you're actually going to start working that morning or as you're working through that election day. The detail that we have here, the most important pieces we're going to talk about on later slides, so you don't have to worry too much about following along through all of these items right now. I'll pull out a couple of important ones in each category, though, for you uh, that you might want to asterisk or highlight. Uh, first and foremost, whenever you show up to work on Election Day, whether or not it's at 6 in the morning as an opener or 2 o'clock because you're working a part day, uh, you need to make sure you take the election judge oath. Your head judge is going to help you with that. Your head judge is going to be the person who's responsible for operating the polling place. We've got a couple of head judges in the room with us today. Uh, those head judges go through additional training to help manage the polling place. Um, we want to make sure that uh, if you can't track them down right away for some reason, or maybe that sheet got put away and we're, we've just forgotten about it, we need to make sure you sign in as an election judge and take that oath before you begin acting as an election judge. So that would be important out of that category. And then we'll talk about the importance of opening the polls at 7 a.m. and what that means on a future slide, but that would be also important off of here. As you're working through the election day, you're going to have uh, something available to you called the incident log. And the incident log is considered the, the diary for the election day. And as election judges, we need to make sure we record anything on that uh, incident log that would be unusual or noteworthy in the polling place. So we're not recording the minute by minute or hour by hour activities. We're recording instances that just are out of the norm. So in previous elections, some of the fun ones that would be on there is a, a dog ran into the polling place. And so that's not a big deal, but we document that just to say that was something that was unusual. The more commonplace ones would be a ballot jammed in the machine, right? And so then two election judges work together to remove the jam. That's what we document on there. We would document on there if somebody is disrupting the polling place, somebody refused to leave, something like that would all get documented on the various uh, incident logs that will be circulating around your polling place on election day. The rule of thumb for that is when in doubt, just document it. It creates a paper trail for us. It allows us to recreate the elections events if we would be challenged or have any sort of court contest regarding it. So it really helps us um, as administrators review what was going on in the polling place. So we have a question. Third item down, name tags. It says first name, Correct. my last name for election. I put my first name. Yep. Maybe the judge, head judge, had me fill out another one with both first okay. and last. Okay, yep, uh, we should be using first name only on the on the election okay. judge uh, certificates. 
Actually, part of the reason uh, you all had your photos taken today is we're actually going to incorporate that into our badging as well, just to make it very clear that you are supposed to be in the polling place and you're who you say you are. We know you're who you say you are, but that will help our voters with a little mm -hmm. bit more confidence. So we'll have those those name tags preloaded now, but it should be first name, and then we never ever include party affiliation on the name tags. And we'll talk about party affiliation in just a bit. All right, very good. All right, so a three election day, we'll talk through all of the roles that election judges fill on some later slides. And then now, so we'll just move to closing the polls. When we talk about closing the polls, uh, the first rule that remember is that the polls are always, always open until 8 p.m. Any voter in line at 8 p.m. is entitled to vote. And we'll talk about exactly what that means in just a bit. Uh, and then as we get through the uh, last voter, we're going to start working through the closing of the polls. And any of our returning judges know there's a lot of work that's in, involved in closing the polls. And so we've provided end of night checklists and we're always looking to improve those and make them better so that we can close the polls as effectively as possible. But it's important that we follow those checklists. And that means as election judges, you'll all get different assignments at the end of the night that you'll help complete. And then you stay in the polling place until you're dismissed by your head judge. And we'll talk again what uh, closing the polls uh, means in a little bit more detail in just a couple of slides. All right, uh, the next uh, slide or two, we'll talk about uh, some of the election day laws that we need you to be aware of. And these laws are important because uh, they are likely to become a, a, a point on election day that you'll need to be aware of, or they're important because they're confusing. We just want to address them early uh, with our election judges so that you can be thinking about it as you prepare to work on election day. Uh, the first rule that we want to make sure that you're aware of again is that the polls open at 7 a.m. No exceptions to that and the, they close at 8 p.m. as long as the voter is eligible to vote and is in line at 8 p.m. That's important for us. The other piece that's important uh, that we want you all to be aware of on this slide is that your party affiliation as an election judge is private data. And so what I mean by that is that it's private data for election day use only. That information cannot be shared outside of election day for any other reason. So when you signed up to be an election judge, uh, you filled out your application and asked you to declare a party. You had four choices because there's four major parties in Minnesota. And if you did not affiliate with one of those parties, you uh, clicked the box that says you were not affiliated. So we really have five categories of judges in Minnesota. Uh, when we actually start making assignments in the polling place, the law tells us that we can have no more than half of the judges in any polling place working being of any one of those five groups or major parties are unaffiliated. Uh, so we have to make sure that we balance that and that requires us to share that information with the head judge and then naturally the election judges that they're working with will be able to figure out that information based on assignments that are being made, right? So we want you to be aware that your party affiliation will be shared, but it is otherwise private data and that information can't be used outside of that election day activity. If you have any questions about that, we can talk more about that offline or if you need to uh, review your party affiliation or if you need to make any changes to something like that, let us know because that is a self-certification. Okay. All right, uh, the opening and uh, closing reminders here again are just for checklist purposes. We spend a couple of slides talking about each of those. Okay. The next set of election day laws that we want to make sure you're aware of are going to be related to how voters can be provided assistance in the polling place. And so under Minnesota law, we want to make sure that everybody who's entitled to vote is able to cast their ballot in the method that's most appropriate for them. So we're always meeting the voters' needs to allow them to vote in however they're most comfortable. And so that means we have some opportunities to provide assistance. Election judges can always provide assistance. That's part of your job on election day. If you're providing assistance in the voting process, that will require two judges of a different political party affiliation to do that work. So that's one of the reasons we collect that party affiliation, as I mentioned. If the voter chooses not to have you provide assistance, they have the opportunity to use the Omni ballot, which is our assisted voting device in the polling place. We'll talk about that in the next class. Or they can actually bring in somebody of their own choosing to provide assistance. That's called a voter assister. And the voter assister under Minnesota law is prohibited to certain classes of people. However, we've had a court decision that's since overruled that law. And so we have to apply the court's decision. So what we see on the screen is the way that the court has told us to apply the voter assistance laws. And you'll see that the first one says that the voter can have anyone assist them except for an employer of that voter, 
or a union representative for that voter. So anybody can help a, a voter if they ask for that help other than their employer or a union representative. Okay. The law says that candidates cannot help voters, but remember the courts have said that we cannot prohibit a candidate from providing assistance. So the voter brings in a candidate or anybody else, as long as it's not their employer or union representative, that individual can provide assistance as long as the voter is asking for it. Okay. So oftentimes we get questions from the judges like, how do you figure that out, right? So the best way to do that is obviously when people approach you to check in uh, to vote, you're going to check people in one at a time. So if two people approach at the same time, it's a reasonable question for the judge to say, oh, are you here to vote as well? And usually that's where the assistant will say, no, I'm here to provide assistance to Joe voter. And that's completely fine. As an election judge, your follow-up is going to be, okay, that's great. You can provide assistance. I just need to make sure you're not a employer of the voter or a union representative for that voter. And then it, or excuse me, the assister answers no to those two questions. We're fine. We don't have to figure out why they need help. We don't have to figure out exactly what the relationship is. That's all up to the voter to be doing that. Okay. So pretty simple process there for us. Okay. Also related to voter assistance, uh, Minnesota law currently limits the number of uh, times somebody can provide assistance in the polling place. But again, the courts have told us that we cannot uphold that law. And so we no longer have a limit on the number of times somebody provides assistance. Okay. The way this usually shakes down in the polling place is you might have somebody providing language interpretation services. And that oftentimes will be for a household or maybe for a household and neighbors. And so that's fine as long as those voters are asking for and looking for that assistance, somebody can translate six, seven, eight times, and that's completely fine. Whereas under law, that would have been limited prior to the court's decision. Okay. Yes, sir. What if one of those people are a union representative or an employee? Then they cannot. Okay, what do you do? Um, in that instance, then you would have to explain that a union representative can't provide assistance under state law, but we have other opportunities. I can have two judges explain it or help the voter. I can show you how to use the Omni ballot to vote independently. But that person won't be able to provide assistance. And then you'll learn that that person now is eligible to be in the polling place because they're not authorized to remain in the polling place. So they'd have to go wait outside the doors or in the parking lot or something like that. Very good question. All right, our last thing on this slide is talking about curbside voting. Curbside voting is another way to provide assistance to a voter. Um, and we just want to make sure that judges are aware that it exists because it was used quite uh, extensively in 2020. Uh, and we expect that use to continue at some level in 2022 and beyond just because people know that it exists now, right? So curbside voting allows a voter to vote from their vehicle or essentially from outside, uh, however that needs to work for them, if they uh, have any reason that would prohibit them from entering the polling place. So usually it would be a mobility issue, but it could be other uh, challenges that would keep them from entering the polling place. As judges, we don't ask for any details on that. We don't qualify anybody to do that. If somebody's saying they want to vote curbside, they vote curbside. It requires two judges. Uh, it requires two judges of different political parties because this is part of the voting process. And essentially what it does is it brings the entire polling place to that individual rather than them coming to the polling place. Uh, the judges will verify who the voter is, help them register if necessary, will issue the ballot, the voter votes that ballot in private, and then those two judges bring that ballot back into the polling place uh, to actually cast it into the tabulator. Yes. Do we take the poll pad out with us? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a really good question. That's a returning judge's question because in the past we've used the poll pad to help us check in voters at, out at their curbside and we're still encouraging that activity. That seemed to work pretty well um, and so we would encourage folks to do that. Our head judges will get training on that and then we also will provide a curbside kit that has the instructions on how to all do all of that. So you'll hear a horn honk or you'll get a, your head judge will get a phone call from us saying, hey, voter Joe is out in the parking lot, needs to vote. Two judges of a different party takes our little kit and away they go to help the voter get uh, curbside voted. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so now that we've kind of covered a couple of the new laws that we needed to make sure that we covered, um, I want to start talking more about here's how voting works. Here's the, the roles that we have for judges and whatnot. 
Um, and you, actually, I guess I've got one more slide before that. We move on with that with one last law that we want to cover. Those pages stuck for me. Uh, and this law is actually probably the most confusing. So we are definitely going to pause here and chat about it. Uh, Minnesota has a law that says that you cannot campaign or participate in political activities in the polling place or within 100 feet of the polling place. Seems pretty easy and straightforward, right? However, about three years ago, the United States Supreme Court issued a ruling that part of our law in Minnesota on those items was unconstitutional. So what that's left us with is that campaigning is still prohibited in the polling place. However, political activities, political speech, political paraphernalia is now allowable in the polling place. Okay, so we've got two different categories, political activities of speech, buttons, whatnot, campaigning, campaign speech, campaign buttons and whatnot, and we treat them separately. If it's campaigning, it's prohibited, it's not allowed in the polling place and we need to do something about it. Uh, political activities we handle differently. To help you understand what is campaigning, uh, the way that the Supreme Court's uh, ruling can be interpreted is, is it's tied to any candidate who's on the ballot in front of you in the polling place, any party that's on the ballot in front of you in the polling place, or any question that's on the ballot in front of you in the polling place. So candidates, parties, questions. So if we've got any of those three criteria being met, that's considered campaigning, not allowed in the polling place, we need to ask uh, that to be stopped um, or, or remedied in some way. So examples of that uh, on your ballots across the county in Blue Earth County is the first congressional race. Jeremy Munson is a local candidate on that ballot, so I use him as my example. Somebody comes with a Jeremy Munson hat on, he's on the ballot, therefore it's campaigning. That hat needs to be removed, turned inside out, shoved in a purse, coat, whatever that looks like in order for that person to comply with law, right? If somebody comes in with a hat that says, um, raise the gas tax, is that a candidate on the ballot, a question on the ballot, or a party on the ballot? No, right? So then that would be political free speech according to the United States Supreme Court and could be worn in the polling place. All right, make some sense? Questions related to that at all? Usually folks kind of get a little glassy eyed at that point trying to figure out the differences. So, so you said, use the example of the hat, but what if somebody comes in with a, a pin Let's say that says Joe Blow for governor or whatever. Can, can they do that? No, so that would that would That's still be covered right. by that. It, it, and it would depend in that instance. So the example that was just presented there is let's say that it says Tim Walls for governor, right? So we go to the ballot in front of us and there's Tim Walls on the ballot in August. No, so that is political free speech for August. But in November, actually, he is on the ballot for the primary because we have a we have a primary contest. So he's on the ballot. So that becomes campaigning for August. Yeah. So he's not able to do that. We'll switch that up a little bit. Uh, none of our city of Maine. Well, that's a bad example too. Um, we'll go to our state senators, our U.S. senators. They're not on the ballot this go round. So if there's a button that says Amy Klobuchar for Senate, she's not on the ballot. So that's allowed to be worn as political free speech. A Tim Walls button. He's on the ballot. So that would have to be removed. Okay. Yes, sir. Still trying to figure out what the Supreme Court ruling is. And I see your big blue banner here yeah. prohibiting a political badge button. Yeah. That's the only thing? Uh, that is my summary on the slide. So it's talking about political so activity. That's a free speech. Correct. Yeah. So the, yep. The, the, the essence of the Supreme Court ruling said that Minnesota's law that prohibited political free speech was unconstitutional. There we go. Um, exactly. Other questions related to this? Or, uh, yes, sir. What if they refuse? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So if you have an instance where a voter refuses to remove campaign material, uh, the election judge asks that question. Usually the greeter judge has that first responsibility. They're the first one to see that. If they refuse that, then we get the head judge involved. And the head judge is going to ask them to also remove that, explain that the law is being violated in this instance. And if the voter still refuses to do that, we document that on our incident, incident log, log. Right? You'll know the voter's name because they're going to check in. Because that's one of the most complicated parts of this law is even though there's a state law that says you can't do this, there's an overarching state law that says anybody who's eligible to vote gets to vote. 
So they still get to vote is the direct answer to your question, but we document that as a violation of state law. And then it gets uh, turned over to the county attorney's office for prosecution. So we explain that to them. And then if they choose to make that choice, that's their choice. The other thing that I'll point out about this is this applies to your polling place, but it also applies to 100 feet surrounding the building that your polling place is located in, provided that 100 foot buffer is public property. So that means that we can follow the sidewalks and the roads around the building. But if there's a house right next door that's private property that's 15 feet away from your front door, those folks get to do whatever they want to do in their front lawn. And we get that question all the time. We get it um, from anybody who's uh, going to be assigned to the armory. Uh, every election, we have folks that are campaigning in the Mankato Clinic parking lot. It just happens, and we can't do anything about that. It's up to the Mankato Clinic to, to allow that or disallow that. So just know that your control is 100 foot around the, the building, assuming or provided it's on public property. All right, good questions, very good questions. All right, so now we can jump into some of the nitty gritty for election day activities. So opening the polls, remember, as I mentioned, opening the polls, um, it's critical that we open the polls at 7 a.m. There's a few things that we know are gonna happen on election day. And one of the things that we know are gonna have happen is that voters are gonna be wanting to vote at seven in the morning. There's just some people who are going to be there ready to, ready to go right away. And so it's our obligation to be ready for that. Some of the things that you want to think about as you're getting the polls ready to be open is that we need to make sure that all of our polling places comply with uh, accessibility provisions in state and federal law. That means that we need to have a voting booth that's wheelchair accessible. It's all provided to you. You just have to put it up. Uh, we need to make sure that we have parking available for voters who may uh, need uh, additional access or accessibility to the polling place. Uh, and so that will oftentimes be pre-marked spots that already exist in your parking lot but it also might require you to mark some spots as handicapped spots if your polling place maybe is using a side door or a different access door. So again, your head judge will know that. Uh, if you're stationed in Mankato on election day, we also have uh, county employees who are assigned to each polling place who have some of that additional information as well for you. Okay, we talked about the name tags already, so we wanna make sure uh, that we comply with that first name only. And then um, also we want to be thinking about uh, just how the polling place is set up uh, to make sure that uh, voters are able to vote in private and that the room flows uh, effectively. Again, your head judge is going to help you with that layout. Oftentimes uh, the table setup, the room layout is all going to occur the night before the afternoon before. In Mankato, our head judges have the latitude to do that. And so oftentimes they'll be calling on their election judges to help out with that. I will say that I'm looking at one of my head judges. Um, we had a facility in the other elections that didn't allow that, but we're done using that facility. All of our places now allow early setup, which is really helpful. And I think most of our small cities and townships do that as well. Last but certainly not least, there is a very fun antiquated Minnesota law that says we must have a flag posted at the entrance of all of our polling places. So we provide you with a flag to put at the entrances of all your polling places. That flag will promptly blow over um, and then you will spend half your day putting the flag back up. So just be prepared for that. Um, and then of course, if we have issues with that, we will remedy them, we'll help you out through that. So uh, next slide again brings us back to voter assistance. Can you tell this is one of the themes for this election training? Uh, we we're kind of informed of some things to be aware of um, for the election cycle from the Secretary of State's office and voter accessibility and voter assistance is something that we wanna pay extra attention to. Uh, voters always have the opportunity to vote in whichever method is right for them. So we treat them equally. We don't make assumptions about their ability to vote or whatnot. I also want to point out on this slide, just because I think it's a really cool opportunity that we're making available. Uh, we're partnering with uh, a nonprofit agency in the community uh, to create an election judge awareness video for, in, uh, for working with voters who are older. And so that video will allow you to um, experience some of the, the uh, conditions that uh, our older voters would be experiencing, macular degeneration, yellowing of the eyes, those, those sorts of things to help you have some awareness on, on how to help them. Uh, that training is going to be available on our election judge website uh, right around the 1st of July. So that will be an opportunity for you if you're curious uh, to see any of that. All right, uh, here's the slide that we already explained. It just takes us into more details about who can provide that assistance. So we can skip over that one for you as well. 
And then uh, for the remainder of our time before we hit break here, so for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, we're going to talk about the election day roles for election judges. And so when you think about these roles, uh, we need to kind of think of them just in a process of voting. It's not necessarily how each polling place is going to be set up, because in some instances we might have multiple people doing these roles, or we might combine some of the roles uh, into one. Uh, so just kind of think about it as the role, uh, as the work that a voter needs uh, to go through, the steps the voter needs to go through, and then you'll kind of get that assignment based on, on your polling place on election day. Also related to that assignment on election day, uh, some head judges move people around so that you get experience in all of these different capacities. Uh, some judges kind of ask for folks who have more experience to work certain areas or whatnot. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in the way that we actually staff the polling place. One thing that's really helpful is if you're able to work the August election uh, to get it, get some time at each of the different stations or rules, because that gives you the ability to get comfortable with that before November when you'll be much busier and you'll kind of have to hit the ground running more or less. So something to think about, uh, it never hurts to ask to try a different job if you're curious how the Omni ballot works or if you wanna spend some time with the tabulator, for example. Mm -hmm. But anyways, let's start at the beginning. So the greeter judge. The greeter judge is gonna be the first person that voters see when they enter the polling place in terms of election staff. And this person is responsible for being the gatekeeper. So they welcome those voters, but they're also going to make sure that that voter's in the right location. And for the August election and the November election this year, that role is going to be super important because this is going to be the first election cycle under redistricting. And so redistricting is that once every 10 year process, right, where we've redivided the population to make sure that everybody is equally represented by uh, representatives all the way from the city level up to the federal level. And that has caused some pretty major changes in Mankato. Our small cities and our townships are pretty much um, unimpacted on this. Uh, there's a couple of changes for some commissioner districts, but they won't feel that as they're voting. Uh, but in Mankato, we had some pretty major shifts. If you're curious to see some of that new stuff that also lives on our website, but to kind of put it into an elections perspective for you, uh, voters in Mankato are gonna have new precinct numbers assigned to them. They're also gonna have new polling places in many instances. So this is exactly how it's gonna shake out. I guarantee it. The greeter judge is going to have many people come to the polling place and say, I voted here for 10 years. Probably did. Not going to call you a liar on that one, um, but there's a good chance you've moved. So we need to make sure that we look at maps that are provided. We use the precinct finder that's provided. We use um, the poll pads to look up voters uh, to make sure that person's in the right spot. Because A, we don't want them to spend time waiting in the wrong line, but B, we definitely don't want them to vote at the wrong location. Poll pad isn't going to let you vote in the wrong location, uh, but we still don't want to go through that process anyway. Will they need to re-register with the shift? Nope. Uh, uh, voters' registrations follow them. That hasn't changed unless they've moved, changed their name or something okay. else. But if, the, if nothing's changed for the voter and it's just redistricting, we've done all of that for them automatically. Voters are going to get notice of all of that change. Uh, every household in Blue Earth County will be receiving a postcard right around the middle of July. It's actually not just Blue Earth County, that's statewide. And that'll tell them where their new location is. So you might have people bring in postcards and that's great. As long as it's one of the new postcards that say it's from redistricting or whatnot. Uh, but we just need to be very careful that we've got folks in the right spots this go around, okay? Uh, so the greeter judge will help with that. The greeter judge is also going to look for folks that might need assistance. Uh, and then also um, will be responsible for that 8 p.m. cutoff uh, uh, as if we have any voters that would be in line at that point in time. Okay. Questions on the greeter judge role? Okay, fun place to start out your day. You get to see every voter uh, because they're all coming through that, uh, that entry point for the polling place. Next up, once the voters entered the polling place, that voter needs to be checked in to verify that they're a registered voter or we might be election day registering them. Most of your voters are gonna be pre-registered unless you're assigned to a polling place near campus or a polling place that's actually on campus. Uh, so for, for most voters, you're gonna ask for their name, their address, you're gonna make sure all of that information is correct. Date of birth is available for you to verify in case you've got uh, instances where you might have junior senior situations. And we want to make sure all that information is correct before we proceed. The poll pad will tell you if it's not the right precinct for the voter, so that'll be a good uh, flag for you. 
Uh, but we want to make sure that the information is always correct before we proceed with checking in the voter. Uh, we're going to make sure that there's no challenge statuses on the voters, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well, especially like a felony challenge. Uh, and then we actually complete the check-in process on the poll pad that you can see on the screen there. Like I said, your next class will actually take that poll pad and spend more time talking about how it works and whatnot. Uh, but they do work pretty efficiently. I looked to some of my returning judges um, who used them. Once you get the hang of them, they help you check in a voter very, very quickly. Uh, the voter checks in, signs their oath, and then uh, gets a receipt to go uh, receive a ballot from the ballot judge. So, questions about that rule? What usually trips up our poll pad judges is they don't take the time that they need to. They, they get a little anxious and try to move quicker than they should. Read the screens, follow the prompts, and you'll be okay. And then the thing that always gets them caught is they, they try to allow the voter to tell them what to do. The voter is going to say, well, my apartment's close enough. Or the voter is going to say, I just got married last week. It doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter. And so once you know that information, we have to go through the right process for them. It's much better for the voter to do it right in the beginning rather than have it get caught as a potential election law violation after the fact. Okay. Can you go through re-registering a little bit more? What what change required in re-registering? What doesn't? Yeah, so that's a great question. Election day registration is going to be about 10 minutes or 15 minutes after we take a break here in just a few minutes. So I'm going to hold that, all right? All right, so the voter has arrived at the polling place. We checked the map, the precinct finder, they're in the right location. They've checked in because they were pre-registered and they get a gold star for being uh, all ready to vote. And now they want a ballot. They get that ballot from the ballot judge. And I've got the ballot judge and the demonstration judge on the same slide here because oftentimes in our precincts and polling places, that's the same job. You usually don't have enough judges to separate out that task and that's actually okay. But so what the ballot judge does is issues the ballot once they've had a voter who's successfully registered or checked in. The ballot judge has to like numbers and counting and recounting and recounting and recounting some more. So some people that's a great job, other people not the right fit for them. Uh, that's fine. Um, but it's really important that we keep a count of all of those ballots. The ballots when they're issued to the polling place are, are certified as a volume or quantity. And then as you start processing and using those ballots during the election day, you must account for them. You need to account for every ballot that's been issued. You need to account for every ballot that's been uh, spoiled. You need to account for every ballot that's been initialed but not used. You need to account for all the ballots that haven't even been used. And so it's a, it's re, it's a responsibility of the ballot judge to make sure that they know where all of those ballots are and they haven't just created a big pile of mess uh, at the end of election night. Okay. Uh, the election uh, judges uh, that initial the ballots to make them official can be any two judges. That's the one spot in the law where we don't have to worry about party balance. Okay? So just something to be aware of. Uh, and uh, the initialing of the ballot is what makes that an official ballot. As you've got stacks and stacks of unofficial ballots, those are just expensive pieces of paper. Once we get two initials on there, that becomes an official ballot that we absolutely have to maintain and manage. Okay. Uh, once the ballot has been issued or prior to the ballot being issued, if we have a demonstration judge separate, uh, we want to make sure the voter understands how to mark the ballot. We never, ever, ever point to actual candidates on the ballot. You'll always have little sample sheets that you can use to um, show somebody how to fill in an oval if they need that assistance. Uh, but we're never directing a, a voter how to, how to actually vote by pointing to a candidate or an oval on the ballot. Uh, one other thing that we share with voters is that they're entitled to a replacement ballot if they would um, make a mistake on their ballot. And in this election in August, there's a very good chance that you're going to have lots of ballots that have mistakes on them. Those are called spoiled ballots. It's totally normal. It's no problem. It's more embarrassing for the voter than it is an issue to correct. Uh, but when we uh, get into that spoiled ballot situation, that'll involve um, a ballot judge, or excuse me, a tabulator judge, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. Um, the instructions that you're going to be issuing in August are going to be pretty important to trying to reduce the number of spoiled ballots. Uh, for folks that maybe aren't aware, the August ballot is going to be a state partisan primary election on the front. So that means you're going to have four columns on the ballot, one for each of the four major parties. And voters in Minnesota are only allowed to vote in one of those columns. So the instruction to the voter is choose a column that you affiliate with and vote for candidates only in that column. Hopefully that'll work. 
If it doesn't work and they vote across the ballot, that is called cross party voting and the tabulator will reject that ballot. And we issue a spoiled ballot, right? So that's the front of the ballot. The back of the ballot across uh, Blue Earth County will have a special election on it. And so even though that is a partisan race for first congressional district, we no longer have a partisan requirement. So a voter can choose somebody from the grassroots uh, legalized marijuana or grassroots cannabis party on the front and on the back pick somebody from the legal marijuana party if they choose to. There's no requirement to match there. So tell them on the front of the ballot, choose a column. On the back of the ballot, all bets are off. They can do whatever they'd like. Add right. one more wrinkle for all of you friends. Um, on the back of the ballot, we will also have a nonpartisan primary for the city of Mankato. So you've actually got like three types of elections occurring on the same ballot. That's more of a problem for us to manage, not for you. Uh, you just have to get the instructions out to the voters. <laughs> Questions about that at all? Yes, ma'am. Just comment. I think the trickiest thing is to not give a ballot until you've got that receipt. Yeah. Because we had somebody like almost walk out the door and I was like, is that a receipt in your hand? And they had never surrendered the receipt. Yeah. So, and then you've got to recount and recount and recount yeah. and recount until you want to use them. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You do a lot of counting at the ballot table. That's a very good point. Um, at the All of our duties or all of our positions across the election day have a checklist or set of instructions that you'll receive before you start that task. It just reminds you what to look for. And that's one of the most key points there is that you never ever give a ballot until you've received a, a signed re or a, a receipt for that ballot. Uh, that's how we account for that to make sure that that person really did check in and didn't bypass the line. So receipt in, ballot out is the way we do that. Very good. All right, so we've got our ballot tabulator judge. So we're now to the home stretch. The ballot tabulator judge um, gets to uh, make sure that the ballot that has been voted by the voter can be cast into the machine to be tabulated and become part of the election night. Results. Uh, so the first rule associated with the tabulation part is that that's done in private for the voter. So the person who works this station needs to stay uh, outside of a six foot buffer of the tabulating machine. So that's usually marked on the floor. That's part of our setup process. Uh, so there's a little bit of a requirement for this individual to be able to hear a, a an audible chime, but it's not a very loud chime if you happen to have a busy polling place. The ballot also kicks back out, but we want to stop the voter before it even gets all the way back out if possible. So we need somebody who can kind of uh, pay attention to some of those details for us. Um, but the machine is smart enough to say you voted too many times, you've crossed over, anything that would make that ballot uh, uncountable. And so then you can offer to troubleshoot that with the voter if they need assistance, or really what you're there to do is make sure they don't leave uh, without making up their mind. And then we also wanna just reassure them that getting a new ballot is not a problem. It will happen more times than you'll care to count in August. Um, so this person kind of just has to be able to help troubleshoot and, and solve some of those problems. This is a very important piece of equipment. So our ballot tabulator judge is also gonna make sure that nobody else is um, loitering around the equipment, trying to see components of the equipment that they're not entitled to look at. They're there to feed a ballot into the machine. If we would ever need to approach any of the components in the machine, if we have a jammed ballot or something like that, that always involves two judges, different political parties, and then also is gonna be recorded on your instant log whenever we get into those instances, all right? So with that, I think we are going to take a pause here. We'll